So now for today, anybody who thinks, speaks, and writes about the role of justice in Christian scripture must confront the issue of the relation between justice and love in Christian scripture. For the obvious reason that love is at least as important in Christian scripture as justice. This theme of love is encapsulated in John 3, 16. I mean, it runs through all scripture, of course, the New Testament, but we can view it as encapsulated in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that God gave his only begotten son. And then in the two great love commandments, love God above all and love your neighbor as yourself. So our topic for today is love and justice in scripture. Now, scripture somewhere explicitly talked about the relation between love and justice. We could zero in on that passage and talk about it and expound it and interpret it and so forth. But that's not the case. There is no passage in which scripture explicitly talks about the relation between love and justice. Though it talks about both of them, it doesn't spend time discussing how the two are related to each other. And it's of course for that reason that this topic of the relation between justice and love in scripture has been a topic of discussion in the Western theological, philosophical, literary tradition. Um, and the relation between love and justice in the, this, in the literature of the West has not only been a topic of conversation, but it's been a topic of controversy. People have different views as to how these two are related. Now I think if you read the Western tradition's discussion, I don't know about other traditions, if you read the discussion in the West over these two millennia, discussion concerning the relation between love and justice, a prominent theme, I would say the prominent theme, is the theme of tension or conflict between justice and love. Over and over the theme of conflict comes up. The great literary example of that is Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, where mercy and justice are in conflict. But Shakespeare's not odd man out there. It's, it's absolutely typical. Sometimes that theme of tension, OK, the theme of tension, I think is the dominant theme that comes through when you read these 2,000 years, 1,900 years, whatever, of literature on the relation between love and justice. Sometimes the theme is, sometimes the theme takes the form of claiming that there is an inherent conflict between the two, an intrinsic conflict. To act as justice requires is perforce not to be acting out of love. And conversely, to act out of love is perforce not to be acting as justice requires, so that the two are just inherently conflictual. That's a common theme. <laughs> But sometimes you don't find that to be the theme, that there's an inherent conflict. But rather what gets highlighted is examples of conflict between love and justice. They may not be inherently conflictual. Nonetheless, over and over, they come in conflict with each other. And I think that there are three basic, when I, when I look at the discussions of these matters in the West, what comes through to me is that there are three, three things that especially get emphasized. One is this. Generosity is sometimes unjust. The way in which generosity is distributed is sometimes unjust. Charge that forgiveness, amnesty, pardon, and so forth is often a violation of justice is at the heart of the controversy swirling around truth and reconciliation commissions of the last 30, 40 years, um, South America, Argentina, but especially in, in South Africa, um, you remember the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that uh, Bishop Tutu headed up. One of, the, I mean, the most standard, the most standard objection to it was, hey, look, you're violating, violating justice when you when you forgive these people or declare amnesty or or whatever. In this charge that forgiveness is incompatible with doing justice is also at the heart of St. Anselm's discussion. Anselm um, 
great Christian theologian, writing in the early Middle Ages. His book, Proslogion, is, uh, is a brief compendium of Christian theology. And in the course of it, Anselm discusses God's justice. And he's, uh, here's, here's how he puts it. The whole book is, in, in effect, a prayer to God. Here's what Anselm says, addressing God. How do you spare the wicked? Forgive. How do you spare the wicked if you are all just and supremely just? How do you spare the wicked if you are all just and supremely just? So you, you see there's the theme of conflict is right there. How, how are these two compatible, oh God, your forgiveness with your justice? Um, Anselm was a, one of the great glittering geniuses of the Western Christian tradition, but his answer to this question um, would not bring him much fame, let me just put it like that. Uh, it's by no means Anselm at his best. We're not going to get into what he says. Uh, it's unhelpful. <laughs> huh? <laughs> So, okay, let's get into the issues. There are different kinds of justice, as I've been noting, just as, there, just as there are different kinds of love. So a question that naturally comes to mind, once you've noted this theme of tension between love and justice, is what kind of justice and what kind of love are the writers talking about? Okay, theme of justice. It occurs to you that there are different kinds of justice and different kinds of love, and so an obvious question is what, what kind of justice and what kind of love do these writers think come into conflict with each other? In my first talk, I distinguished between what I called primary justice and criminal justice or corrective justice. Corrective justice is what becomes relevant, I said, when there's been a breakdown in primary justice. And so the question is, what kind of justice are these people talking about when they see tension? And I think the answer has to be all kinds, all kinds. Or rather, sometimes one kind and sometimes another. When the generosity of the landlord in Jesus' parable is challenged, it's primary distributive justice that's at stake. When forgiveness is said to violate justice, it's corrective justice which is in view. So pretty much any all kinds of justice uh, turn up in these discussions concerning conflict between love and justice. I think the situation with respect to love, the kind of love that they've got in mind, is different. Let me distinguish a few kinds of love. That is to say, a few kinds of things that in English we call love. Different languages would do it somewhat differently. One thing that we often use the word English love to refer to is the kind of love that consists of being attracted to something, being drawn to something on, a kind, on account of its worth, its excellence. Somebody just says, I just love Beethoven's late string quartets, let's say. I do, in fact, happen to just love Beethoven's late string quartets. The kind of love that's being expressed there is being drawn to something, right? Just being attracted to it for its worth. Or you say, I just love the new house that we found and that we bought. This is, this is the love of being drawn to something. The Greek word for that kind of love was eros, E-R-O-S. And a classic discussion of it was, occurred in Plato's Symposium. It's all about eros. And when you look at what kind of love Plato has in mind, there is this love of being drawn to something on account of its worth. Another kind of love, another kind of thing that we call love, is being attached to something, being invested in it. A cat shows up on your door one winter morning, and you take pity on it. You open the door, you give it some milk, some cat food, and so forth, 
and um, eventually you become attached to it, right? But it may not be the best cat around. You may agree that your neighbor's cat is a finer cat. Your cat might win no honors in a cat show. I don't know if there are cat shows. There are dog shows, right? But I don't know if there are cat shows, are there? Um, but you're drawn to it. I mean, you're not drawn to it. You're just attached to it. So attachment is different. Attachment love is different from attraction love. They may or may not coincide. Um, you see the point. We can, we're attached to things that we don't say, no, it's not the best around. But it's my cat, and I'm attached to it. Couldn't care less that yours is a finer cat. There's a third thing that we call love in English, and that is love is generosity or benevolence. The love that seeks to advance the good of the other person, or the good of the cat, as a matter of fact, or the dog. Love is benevolence or generosity. So three kinds of love, at least. Um, attraction, attachment, benevolence. Now the conclusion. To the best of my knowledge, every writer who talks about the conflict or tension between love and justice has that last kind of love in mind. Love is benevolence. Love is generosity. Maybe some exceptions, but to the best of my knowledge, it's that third kind of love that writers, when they're discussing Christian love and the supposed conflict between love and justice, it's always love as benevolence that they've got in mind. So what this means is that writers understand biblical love, the love of God for us, the love that God enjoins on us for our neighbor. Writers understand biblical love as generosity, benevolence, not attraction, not attachment, benevolence. Okay, so here's where we are. I've said the standard theme in discussions about love and justice is theme of conflict. You've got to ask yourself what kind of justice and what kind of love do these discussions have in mind? And you'll find all kinds of justice popping up in these discussions. And systematically, one kind of love, love understood as benevolence or generosity or charity or something like that. <laughs> Now, I th happen to think, here's the next step, I happen to think that those specific conflicts are interesting. That is, I think it's interesting to think about when generosity becomes unjust. I think it's important to think about that. I think it's important to consider when, bene when paternal benevol paternalism becomes unjust. I think it's important to ask whether forgiveness undermines justice. Those are all important questions and intellectually interesting questions. But I'm going to set them all off on the side so as to raise a question that comes up before any of this. If love is gratuitous benevolence, so often yields conflict or apparent conflict with justice. Let me say it again. If love understood as gratuitous benevolence, so often yields conflict or apparent conflict with justice in such a way that you're forced to choose between the two. May it be that we are misunderstanding what scripture means by love. May it be that when Jesus told us to love the neighbor as ourselves, he did not have in mind purely gratuitous benevolence. And may it be that what Jesus did have in mind when he spoke of loving the neighbor, may it be that what Jesus did have in mind does not come into conflict with justice. May it be that there's harmony between the two. May it be that there's some deep form of unity. May it be that we should rethink our understanding of love and maybe of justice so that the two are not in tension or conflict with each other. Instead of just assuming that what Jesus had in mind was gratuitous benevolence and then talking about the tensions that arise, may it be that we should back up and say maybe he didn't have that kind of love in mind 
and may it be that the kind of love he did have in mind does not yield tension or conflict. That's the thought I want to explore. So Randy is suggesting that the tension may not arise only because of different understandings of love operative, or different kinds of love that you've got in view, but also different kinds of justice, and that some people are seeing the tension between love as they understand it and primary justice, as I called it, and other people are understanding the tension as between love, as they understand it, and restorative or corrective or whatever justice. That's another possibility. So I think in lecture four, I want to talk about punishment, and so we're going to get, we're going to get into that eventually. Yeah, good point. Here, here, this morning what I want especially to probe is how we should understand love. How we should un understand, here, better. Jesus attributes, the, the New Testament, well, the whole Bible, the New Testament attributes love, of, on, love to God for God's human creatures, and enjoins love on us for our neighbors and for God. I want to explore what that kind of love is. And my thesis so far is, it, is that it's been usually understood in such a way that there's tension between at least some kinds of justice, um, Randy. Uh, I want to argue that, that that's a misunderstanding of biblical love and that a proper understanding sees harmony and not tension. Okay. So the Greek word that the New Testament writers use to report Jesus' injunction to love God above all and one's neighbor as oneself and to describe God's love, the Greek word that the New Testament writers use is agape, A-G-A-P-E, agape. And the view that what Jesus meant by agape was gratuitous, self-sacrificing benevolence, or generosity, the view that that's what Jesus meant by agape, was never more thoroughly developed than it was in a movement in 20th century Protestant ethics. It was never more thoroughly developed than in a movement in 20th century Protestant ethics called agapism. A-G-A-P-I-S-M, from the Greek word agape. So I think a good way to get into the issues here is for me ever so briefly to talk about what the members of that movement said. The two great writers of the movement are, I call it a 20th century movement, which mainly it is, but it was preceded by the great 19th century, anticipated I should say, by the great 19th century Danish philosopher Kierkegaard, K-I-E-R-K, K-I-E-R-K-E-G-A-A-R-D, Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard's great, one of Kierkegaard's great works, Works of Love. It's worth everybody's reading it someday is a brilliant working out of this particular understanding of love, as sheer, gratuitous, self-sacrificing benevolence. And the other great work in the movement was by a Swedish Lutheran bishop in the 1930s, whose name was Anders, A-N-D-E-R-S, Anders, Nygren, N-Y-G-R-E-N, Anders Nygren, N-Y-G-R-E-N, in his book Agape and Eros. So he's just taking the two Greek words, Agape and Eros. I think there can be no doubt that Kierkegaard was the more profound but that Nigren was the more influential. <laughs> and that Nigren also spent more time discussing the relation between love and justice than Kierkegaard ever did. So I want to take a brief look with you at Nigren because it seems to me it captures the issues as well as they've ever been captured. The fundamental issues. So okay, a very brief look at 
Negron's discussion. Negron saw three great motifs, as he called them, themes. Three great motifs as locked in a struggle for dominance in Western thought. Three great themes, three great motifs locked in a struggle for dominance. Here are the three. One is the theme of Eros, which we've already come across. Love is attraction to what's of worth. One theme is Eros. And he rightly saw that theme as typical of the Platonic tradition. Plato's Symposium, but more broadly. Parenthesis. Negrin criticizes Eros as a form of self-love, which has always seemed to me crazy. When I say I love the late Beethoven string quartets, this strikes me as not a form of self-love. It's the quartets that I love, not myself. So it just strikes me as weird to call it self-love. Struggling yeah. for dominance in the Western intellectual tradition, and hence in our lives. But so one theme is Eros in the Platonic tradition. A second motif, theme, says Negrin, is nomos, N-O-M-O-S. The Greek word for law, for law, for legal, legal arrangements for law. And Negrin says that the theme of the Old Testament is nomos, law, and he connects law with justice. So the Platonic tradition, eros, Old Testament, law, nomos, justice. And the third great, great motif, theme, in Western thought is, you could guess it now, agape. Sheer gratuitous benevolence which pays no attention to justice, to law. And you can see where this goes now. It's the theme of agape that's prominent in the New Testament. So Platonic tradition, eros, Old Testament, nomos, law, justice, New Testament, agape, sheer gratuitous benevolence. This, says Negrin, is the love that Jesus attributes to God and that Jesus enjoins on us for our neighbors. <laughs> Negro never hesitated to affirm this implication of that view. In the New Testament, love displaces justice. Let me say it again. He never hesitated to affirm this implication of that view. Remember, Old Testament is justice, nomos. New Testament is agape. Here's an implication of that. In the New Testament, justice gets displaced, supplanted, superseded, whatever word you like. He never hesitated to affirm that. He was, he was perfectly willing to say this. The Old Testament God is a God of justice. The New Testament God is a God of love. And justice and love are not by any means the same. Let me read a few passages to assure you that this is indeed what Negrin said. You with me so far, or with Negrin? A few passages. These are quotations from Negrin. Jesus enters into fellowship with those who are not worthy of it. And his doing so is directed against every attempt to regulate fellowship with God by the principle of justice. Let me read it again. Jesus enters into fellowship with those who are not worthy of it. And his doing so is directed against every attempt to regulate fellowship with God by the principle of justice. 
Here's another passage. That Jesus should take lost sinners to himself was bound to appear not only to the Pharisees, but to anybody brought up and rooted in Jewish legal righteousness as a violation of the order established by God himself and guaranteed by his justice. Let me read it again, Lord. That Jesus should take lost sinners to himself was bound to appear to anybody reared in Judaism as a violation of the order established by God himself and guaranteed by justice. And one another, for people reared in Judaism, Jesus taking lost sinners unto himself, is a violation not only of the human, but above all of the divine order of justice, and therefore of God's majesty. So the Jesus of the New Testament is violating God's order of justice. So, here's what he says in one more passage. Motivated justice, there's justice, you're doing what justice requires. Motivating, motivated justice must give place to unmotivated love. We are not to love the neighbor in addition to treating her as justice requires. We are to love her instead of treating her as justice requires. That's Negrin's position. So in my first talk, I mentioned that many evangelical Christians in my country are uncomfortable with talk about justice and uncomfortable with organizations devoted to securing justice. And I mentioned pretty quickly that one reason they have for this discomfort and suspicion is that they believe that in the New Testament, justice has been displaced, supplanted, superseded by love. Okay. It now turns out that those North American evangelicals are by no means alone in their interpretation of Scripture. This is exactly how the Swedish Lutheran bishop Anders Negren in the 1930s interpreted the New Testament. So let me stop there for a moment. You get the idea? Over and over, Negren hammers home this thought. Three great motifs, eros, nomos or justice, agapic love. In the New Testament, agapic love supersedes Old Testament justice. Displaces it, supplants it, whatever word you want to use, transcends it, um, dismisses it, um, <laughs> take whatever word you want. So when I bumped up against this attitude in my in, among North American evangelicals in my talk about justice, uh, I now know that they're reflecting a mentality that goes much deeper than just North American evangelicals. It's some, um, you know, frankly, I think what, uh, what Negrin is doing here is capturing a, a theme, at least in the Lutheran tradition and to some extent in the Protestant, Protestant tradition more generally. He's, he's, he's framing it as pointedly and as crisply as anybody ever has, which is why I've chosen them. But it's not, it's not an utterly foreign development. When, when people hear Negrin's position, they may feel a little bit uncomfortable when they see the implication that the New Testament displaces the Old Testament, that the God of love of the New Testament is not the God of justice of the Old Testament. That may put it a little bit more sharply than they like. But apart from that, they have the feeling, yeah, he's, he's, he's saying what I've sort of thought. Which is why Negrin had the influence he did it. It was, just not, it was not some brand new idea, but people had the feeling he was capturing with the courage of his conviction. I mean, what we're gonna see is Negrin is gonna spin out the consequences of this, the implications. And some of the implications will be such that most people would say, ew, we gotta back up. Whereas Nequin consistently said, no, 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 I'm just revealing the startling implications of the New Testament understanding of agape. Don't back up. Um, yeah, it, it goes back to some of the things I was saying in my first talk. I think if, 
if we acknowledge that the situation before us is a situation of injustice, as opposed to a situation which it would be good to treat with charity, if we acknowledge it, acknowledge it as a case of injustice, two or maybe three things follow. One is you're criticizing somebody. You're criticizing whoever is perpetrating the injustice. And secondly, that implies that something, something, in the practice, something in what people are doing, what those people are doing or what I'm doing has to change. Whereas if it's a situation that calls for love, you're not, you don't have to criticize anybody. You just give them food. You don't ask why they lack food, and you don't criticize anybody. So I think, I think ultimately, to think of the situation in terms of love as opposed to justice leaves us feeling it's much more comfortable. Yo, yo me paro. Me quiero referir al texto de los del del dueño de la viña y los trabajadores. I'd like to go back to the parable of the vineyard and the workers. Si se ve el, el si se lee el texto desde la perspectiva solamente de lo que aparece, si podemos leer en el texto y no vemos el contexto. If we read that parable just in the context of what's right there on the page, but not in the context of what was actually happening when the parable was told. Entonces, no vamos a ver el sentido de justicia que está ahí descrito en el texto. Then that's why we might miss the sense of justice that actually comes through in that parable. Right. I want to come back to the parable. Voy a regresar a esta parábola. Usted tiene completa razón. Sí. En el, ¿puedo decir? Mm -hmm. en el sentido de el dar a todos el denario que significaba la sobrevivencia de un día. And in the sense that giving all the workers that same payment, which was a day's wage, es lo que necesitaban para vivir. Is what they needed to live, to stay alive. Desde la perspectiva legal, no, le, no, no debían tener eso, pero desde and la perspectiva de la vida. From a legal perspective, maybe that wasn't a just distribution, but if you're looking at like life as the basis of justice, Esta justicia es un, es un signo del amor. Then no hay, no hay contradicción. It is just, but it's a justice that uh, is in harmony with love. I think that's right. Yo estoy de acuerdo. Eh, yo creo que la justicia y el amor deben impartirse juntos. I think love and justice should go together. Yes. Después de trabajar con justicia restaurativa, Veo que la justicia y el amor producen en el agresor como en la víctima paz. And in my own work with restorative justice, I've seen that love and justice done together produce both in the aggressor and in the victim peace as an end result. I think that's also correct. Creo que eso es correcto también. Say a little bit more there. Well, I find that, okay, so my students are, I think. I bet you've got to stand up so that people can. I find that my students are, okay, well, I'm wondering about the link between postmodern thought and this willingness to accept evil. Hmm. Um, and I'm thinking about my students. Yeah. Uh, so I think that there may be a point beyond postmodern thought, but I think postmodern thought has informed their ethics. And I find that they are very quick to think this way. Really? Um, that, and I think it is a lack of understanding of the Old Testament in general, so it kind of ties into that juvenile uh, idea of Christianity that you brought up the other day. But that's really all that they've been taught. And so that's where they begin uh, their conversation about Christian ethics. Um, and I mean, eventually, as they become more educated, they can have a deeper conversation, but I find that many of them really function in that arena. And when they become more educated, they, in the Old Testament, the problem arises for them. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes it gets confused. Right. 
And, and I find that sometimes that's why my students really want nothing to do with traditional church, because it's about rules. You know, and all of this kind of flows out of that um, in one way or another. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a, lot, there's a lot wrapped up in that, but I wonder about the influence of postmodern thought in this world. See, that's fascinating because, because Nguyen connects law, normos, with justice. He, he just connects the two. Yeah. So I don't know. I just wanted to throw that out there. So for those of you who are interested in the history of Christian theology, um, there was an Egyptian theologian, Marcion, M-A-R, M-A-R-C-I-O-N of the second century, who argued that the Jesus of the New, that the God of the New Testament was a different God from the God of the Old Testament. Marcion was declared a heretic. It's utterly fascinating to me that there's a footnote by Nguyen in Agape and Eros. A footnote. Now this is being Agape and Eros is by a Lutheran Swedish bishop, okay? There's a footnote in which Nguyen says he recognizes the Marcion tendencies in his thought. Period. <laughs> I have always been baffled how, what do I want to say, how we got, why this didn't cause him trouble. I mean, he was being very candid there. Uh, I mean, it's clearly a Marcionite. The God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament is law and justice. The God of the New Testament is love, and love's, love displaces justice. It doesn't incorporate it, it displaces it. So, so, so let's, let's take the next step. So, why, so here's the next question. And why? Why did Negrin think that love displaces, supplants, supersedes, whatever word you want? Why did he think that agapic love displaces justice in the New Testament? His answer was very clear. And, you know, one thing I like about Negrin, I think it's all dead wrong, but one thing I like about it is that it's very lucid and once you grant, grant the opening premises, it, it just sort of, and he, he doesn't back off. He says, so be it. Here's his reason why, here's his argument for saying that in the New Testament, love supplants justice. Negwin says, the paradigm in the New Testament, paradigm, you know what I mean by paradigm? You've got a good translation for it. <laughs> the paradigm in the New Testament for how we should think of God's love is that we sh should think of it in terms of God's forgiveness. Whenever you come across God's love in the New Testament, read it through the lens. Here we go, Randy. Read it through the lens of God's forgiveness. That's, that's always how you should think of love. God's forgiving and covenanting love of the sinner. Okay. Now, God's forgiveness is not an example of doing what justice requires. Justice did not require that God forgive the sinner. The wrongdoer cannot claim that justice requires that God forgive him. So read all, whenever you come across the word love, agape in the New Testament, read it through the lens of forgiveness. Here's Nigman's conclusion. When the New Testament talks about love, it wants us to expel all idea of justice. Because forgiveness is not something that justice requires. Forgiveness is purely good, pure gratuitous grace and benevolence. So that's the paradigm. So think of God's love as pure gratuitous benevolence. New Testament love is an utterly gratuitous, utterly gracious exhibition of God's concern for our well-being. Let me give you one more quote. This is from the German theologian of the mid-20th uh, mid century, Emil Brunner. 
B-R-U-N-N-E-R, Bruner. Bruner's part of the same movement. Sorry? Yeah, Emil, E-M-I-L, Bruner, B-R-U-N-N-E-R. In his book, Justice and the Social Order, brief quotation from Bruner, love, that is New Testament love, love does not render to the other what is his due, what belongs to him by right, but gives of its own, gives that to which the other has no right. You see how the two are pitted against each other. And, I, and I've learned to think that in reading people in this movement, Kierkegaard, Bruner, Nieguin, and so forth, when you're mystified by why they're saying what they say, always go back to this. Think of all love through the lens of forgiveness. And then remind yourself that forgiveness is an act of pure grace. That the forgiven person doesn't have a, a right to be forgiven. And then everything, my experience, everything in Negron, Kirkuor, and so forth slides into place. Otherwise, you're just mystified as to why are they saying this? So Negron took his line of thought a step further. Agapic love, remember, is blind to justice and injustice. It pays no attention to them. And consequently, Agapic love may sometimes perpetrate injustice. Negrin says it emphatically. You must not assume that the two just snuggle nicely together. Agapic love may come in conflict with what justice requires. And when they do, you, know, you can guess by now what he says, when they do conflict, go with love and say goodbye to justice. If love requires acting unjustly, so be it. But, but here's the, now, now we get to the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. Um, here's how Negwin understood the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. You remember the parable. The manager for this vineyard needs day laborers. So he goes out at 8 o'clock and finds some day laborers standing around in the marketplace and he says, you work in my vineyard and I'll give you the, the going daily wage. He needs some more laborers, goes out at 9 o'clock, whatever. He says, I'll give you whatever's right. Goes out at 10 o'clock and as I recall, the last time he goes out for more workers is 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock or something like that. Then he has the manager pay them. And, and the manager pays them in the reverse order of their being hired. So the latecomers are paid first, and they're paid the going daily wage. And then the early workers expect to be paid considerably more, and they're also paid the going daily wage. And so the, the early workers grumble. Um, this is, this, you're not being fair to us. Negwin interprets the landowner as saying, true, I'm not being fair to you. I'm not treating you justly. But don't I have a right to be generous as I wish to be generous? Don't I have a right to be generous even if I violate justice? That's Negrin's interpretation of the parable. I want to come back to that. But that's his interpretation. And that's one of his basic defense, apart from looking at everything through the lens of forgiveness, one of his basic textual bases is to say this is what this is what the parable of the laborer in the vineyard says. Am I, not, am I not entitled to be generous, even if I am unjust? So here's, as you see, here's the lesson that Negwin drew. 
we must expect that agapic love, self-sacrificing generosity, we must expect that that will sometimes wreak injustice. No matter, the follower of Jesus is called to be faithful to love, even at the cost of wreaking injustice. Now, many people who would be inclined to go along with Negrin this far would feel edgy at this point. And they would feel edgy because they will have been assuming that what justice requires and what love does snuggle nicely together. And Negrin is sort of rubbing, rubbing our noses and saying, why do you assume that? In the parable of the vineyard, generosity was unjust. Don't assume that the two will snuggle nicely together. You have to assume that they will conflict sometimes. Stick with love. Okay. Before I say what I think about all this, <laughs> let me briefly add this. The other figure in this modern day Agapist movement who thought most seriously about the relation between love and justice was the American theologian Reynold Niebuhr, N-I-E, North American theologian, sorry, <laughs> there's also South America, was a US theologian, Reynold Niebuhr, N-I-E-B-U-H-R. Niebuhr interpreted New Testament love the same way Nigman did, self-giving generosity that pays no attention to what justice requires. And he too recognized that justice and agapic love might conflict. He doesn't make the naive assumption that they just snuggle nicely together. But, Niebuhr thought that Nigrun's reply or response to the possibility of conflict was naive. Nigrun says, stick with love, say farewell to justice. Niebuhr thought that was naive. He thought that that as a political and social policy would be a calamity. And part of what was going on in Niebuhr's mind was his intense dissatisfaction with American liberal Christianity of the 20s. He interpreted the liberals as saying, if we Christians just love enough, other people will also respond with love, and the new age will arrive. Niebuhr thought this was incredibly naive. Okay, you're confronted with Hitler. You think that just loving Hitler enough is gonna turn Hitler into a loving human being? Niebuhr thought this was incredibly naive as to the source of evil and sin in human beings. Try loving Hitler. He's going to execute you or run you over. So what do we do when the two conflict? Go with justice. Do we forget love? No, here's Niebuhr's solution. Love is for the age to come, when there is no conflict. Justice is for this present age of conflict. Let me say it again. Love is for the God's new age, when there is no conflict. When there is no conflict, love won't produce injustice. Justice is for this present age of conflict. With this exception, in some small situations, families, small groups, groups like this, we can love each other without producing injustice. But move it to bigger situations, states, universities, cities, to Gusigalpa. Um, love is going to get run over. It's going to stand by and let injustice happen. So go with justice. 
pray God for the new age in which we can love each other without perpetrating injustice. So that's two different takes, two different ways of working out the relation between love and justice. When you understand love as agape, as pure benevolent generosity that pays no attention to justice. Now I want to say what I think about it. Questions so far? So I think this line of thought is untenable. <laughs> unacceptable. In the first place, it's exegetically unacceptable. First, Negrin has misinterpreted the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. This being one of his main textual supports. The landowner in the parable does not say to the complaining workers what Negrin interprets him as saying. Here's Negrin's interpretation once again. Negrin says, the landowner says, I agree that I have treated you unjustly, but don't I have a right to dispense my generosity as I wish? That's Negrin's interpretation. I agree that, uh, to the complainers, I agree that I've treated you unjustly, but do I not have a right to be generous as I wish? Let me actually quote what the landowner says, okay? This is a quote. Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? I choose to give to these last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Friend, I do you no wrong. The Greek word translated as no wrong here is, here we go back to last time, adikos. Dik, dik, and a, when you preface it with a means non, as an, as an atheist, as a non-theist, and so forth. Friend, I do you no wrong. Friend, I am not treating you unjustly. That's what the landowner says to the complainers. What the landowner is saying is, you have to change your views about justice. I didn't treat you wrongly. He's not saying what Negrin says. Yes, I did treat you wrongly, unjustly, but it, isn't that okay? What he's saying is, I did not treat you wrongly. I did not treat you adikos. I did not treat you unjustly. So it's just, a, it's just a plain misinterpretation of the parable. Though, in my experience, I find a lot of people intuitively interpret the parable along Nikun's line. But what he actually says is, I did not treat you adikos. I did not treat you unjustly. Now it's worth, having, it's worth having a discussion sometime in some other place about why he didn't treat them unjustly. But that's clearly what he's saying. Hey, look, you complainers. <laughs> You're just wrong in saying that I treated you unjustly. I didn't. So there isn't any conflict between love, generosity, and justice in this parable. <laughs> so, Negrin's line of thought is exegetically untenable. I think it's also systematically incoherent, and here's why. We are always to think of love on the model of forgiveness, says Negrin, and people don't have a right to forgiveness. Okay. But think for a minute about the nature of forgiveness. You can't just spread forgiveness hither and yon. Samuel, I'd like to give you some forgiveness. <laughs> Lori, I'd like to give you some too. You can't just spread forgiveness hither and yon. You forgive people when they've wronged you, when they've treated you unjustly. If you put injustice out of mind, you can't recognize when you're wronged, and so, of course, you can't 
recognize when it's appropriate to forgive. If I never think in terms of injustice and justice, never think in terms of being wronged, I can't possibly, well, I, I can't, then I can't forgive you for the wrong you did me. So Negrin only thinks of one part of forgiveness, that you don't have a right to it. He never thinks about the conditions for forgiveness. You can only forgive when you've been wronged. And so to put injustice out of mind is to, put, is to, is to eliminate forgiveness. And to eliminate forgiveness from Scripture is, well, not to have an awful lot left. Okay? And now for maybe my most important argument. Those are two arguments. Uh, he's misinterpreted the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. Doesn't say what he says it says. Um, and I think when you th think about the nature of forgiveness, you, you see, it just makes no sense to talk about forgiveness when you totally put wrongdoing out of mind. So, all three of the, let's look at the love command. All three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, report the episode in which Jesus delivers the three love commands. Love God above all and your neighbor as yourself. All three of them report it. <laughs> tiny bit of difference in the context. Almost no difference, there's no difference in the actual wording of the uh, commandments. Only these two tiny differences. Mark prefaces it with the Jewish Shema, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And Matthew says that the second command is like unto the first. Otherwise, there are simply no differences. <laughs> So consider the two commands. The first says that we are to love God with our whole heart and being, and the second that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. We are to love God with our whole being. Nguyen interprets love as gratuitous generosity. He doesn't think we can treat God with gratuitous generosity. So Negrin has the courage of his conviction, and he says that Jesus and the synoptic, synoptic Gospels were speaking loosely when they said we should love God. What they really meant was that we should have faith in God. You see the argument? Love is gratuitous generosity. You can't treat God with gratuitous generosity. We read here that <laughs> in the Gospels that we're supposed to love God, so Negrin says, yeah, they were talking loosely, not, not very precise. If they'd been speaking precisely, they would have said, pistis. They would have said, we should love God. Uh, we should have faith in God. <laughs> well, if you say that the first commandment really means we should have faith in the God, and the second means that we should have agopic love for our neighbor, what do we do with Matthew's claim that the second commandment is like unto the first? Uh, Negrin never says anything on the matter, just doesn't talk about it. Now consider the second command. Love your neighbor as yourself. This has a familiar just as, so also structure, right? Just as, so also. Just as you love yourself, so also love your neighbor. I think we should hear it like this. You love yourself, right? So also love your neighbor. So the second command presupposes the legitimacy of self-love. It doesn't tell us to love ourselves. It takes for granted that we do. You love yourself, right? So also love your neighbor. But love of self is not obviously not gratuitous, self-giving generosity. In this case, Negrin doesn't say that Jesus was speaking loosely and imprecisely. He just says flat out that Christianity is opposed to all forms of self-love. And in no passage that I know of does he ask how that's compatible with the second love command, which takes self-love for granted. But now for the point I really want to get to. 
the two love commands are presented as, um, as the heart of Torah, the law. That's what the questioners ask Jesus, what's the heart, the essence of Torah? And Jesus gives the answer that the two love commandments commandments, and the people who asked him don't disagree. So every, everybody agrees that this is the heart of Torah. <laughs> now I think it's important to notice that these two love commands are not merely the heart of Torah. They are quotations from Torah. Yes, they are the heart, but they are quotations. The first love command is a quotation from Deuteronomy 6. I hope I got it right this time. <laughs> And the second command is a quotation from Leviticus 19. Now, once you know that, I'm sure I'm right about that one. Um, once you know that, then you say to yourself, or I say to myself, maybe if we look them up in the context in which they occur in the Torah, the Old Testament, maybe the context will give us some clue as to how to interpret them. Maybe the context will clue us in as to whether we should or should not interpret love as pure gratuitous benevolence. The context might not help, but context often helps. And it's not, and it's likely that Jesus and the interlocutors would have understood it the same way that it was understood in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, okay? So let's just look at the context of the second command. Leviticus 19. Now actually the context is quite extensive. But I'm going to read, I think it's about four verses which culminate in you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But you're going to get the idea. Here goes. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired servant shall not remain with you all night until morning. Don't keep your pay to yourself and so forth. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. But in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go up and down as a slanderer against your people. And you shall not stand forth against the life of your neighbor. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason with your neighbor, no doubt in case the neighbor has done something wrong, lest you bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear any grudge against the sons of your own people but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord, your God. I am the Lord, your God. Now I haven't counted it, but there were maybe six or seven different you shells there. And an initial thought is, shall we take that last you shall as just one among seven? But clearly that's not how Jesus and his interrogators took it. And it's not how the Jewish tradition takes it. They don't take it as just one among others. They take it as, as the summary. So here's how we should read it. In short, six, seven, 15 injunctions. In short, love your neighbor as yourself. In summary, love your neighbor as yourself. And now for the point relevant to my present concerns. Did you notice that some of those specific injunctions have to do with justice and injustice? Don't oppress your neighbor. You should do no injustice in judgment. Don't keep the wages of your hired servant to invest until, until morning and so forth. Here is the conclusion. Love is not pitted against justice. Examples of doing justice are examples of love, right? Among the examples of loving your neighbor as yourself are examples of doing justice to the neighbor. 
So let me say it again. Justice is an example of love. Not something different from it, not pitted against it. Example. So I think here has to be the conclusion. What do you think? We have to interpret what Jesus meant by love, agape, in such a way that agape incorporates doing justice. It's not indifferent to it. It's not pitted against it. It incorporates it. I think it goes beyond. Don't misunderstand me. Love goes beyond. But love does at least justice. At least. Among the ways of loving your neighbor or treating your neighbor justly. So next time, I want next talk, I want to give a suggestion as to how to understand love so that it incorporates justice. Here all I've done is said we, ha we have to try to understand love in such a way that it incorporates justice. <laughs> and I want to conclude and then throw it out for general discussion with one additional line of thought. A prominent concept in the poetic and prophetic literature of the Old Testament is the Hebrew concept of shalom. S-H-A-L-O-M. And in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Old Greek translation, that is translated as, with the Greek word, Irene, E-I-R-E-N-E. -E. And that Greek word, Irene, then occurs a number of times in the New Testament. When Jesus says, my peace I give unto you, that's the word there is, Irene. Now, shalom in the Hebrew and Irene in the Greek, in our English translations, I don't know about the Latin translations, and our English translations are almost always translated as peace. Shalom and Irene are almost always translated as peace. I think that the word peace is a miserable translation, is a really bad translation. <laughs> Shalom does indeed require that we live at peace with each other. But it goes far beyond the absence of hostilities. I think probably in English the best translation of shalom in Irene is flourishing. Flourishing is probably as close as we're going to get. Flourishing. Flourishing in all dimensions of our existence. <laughs> in our relation to God, in our relation to fellow human beings, in our relation to ourselves, and in our relation to nature, flourishing in all dimensions of our existence. And I think, let me submit, I think we have to see biblical love and shalom as intimately connected in loving God above all and neighbor as ourselves, we aim at shalom. Shalom is the goal of love. The flourishing of the community is the goal of love, the shalom of the community. And now for the important point. When we read what the prophets and the psalm writers say about shalom, what becomes clear is that there is no shalom without justice. There is no shalom without justice. Shalom is not just a feel-good situation. Even if the slaves in the southern U.S. had felt happy with their condition before they were liberated, they didn't, but even if they had, the biblical writers want to say that's not shalom. They may have been content of feeling content, but it's unjust. Even if the so-called blacks and coloreds in South Africa had felt content with their condition, they did not, before liberation, the biblical writers would have said, that's not shalom. Shalom is not just feel good. Shalom requires justice as its, I like to put it like this, as its ground floor, as its basic condition. 
Isaiah 32. There shall be shalom, says Isaiah, when justice dwells in the wilderness and uprightness, rectitude, abides in the fruitful field. So shalom incorporates justice. And biblical love aims at shalom. So I think that's why biblical love incorporates justice. Once again, shalom and love go beyond justice, but they never fall short of justice. They're not to be pitted against each other, but to be understood in such a way that they are integrally connected. Okay, that's what I had to say this morning. So your question is a really good one. Can we render justice to God? Well, I think it's in Psalm 20, uh, 103 that the psalmist speaks of the glory due God's name. So it seems to me that not to give the glory due, to give God the glory due God's name is to wrong God. So I, th I think running throughout the biblical literature is, is the sense that we human beings do indeed wrong God. We do not, we not, do not treat God as God is, as is due God. So, so I think the answer to that is yes. Yeah. Para referirme a la pregunta de él, podemos también revisar en Mateo 25. We can also read in Matthew 25, responding to Joe's, sorry. We can also, uh, responding also to Joe's question, see in Matthew 25. Um, como parte del, del proceso de, de, ju de juicio final, that part of the process of this final judgment described there. Señala que amar a Dios es amar al prójimo que lo vio hambriento, lo vio sediento. Says that when we love others, that's how we love God. Yes. Y, y, le, y algunos le dicen, ¿me diste de comer? O a otros le dicen, no me diste de comer. Entonces, and so God says, you fed me or you didn't feed me. Yeah. Entonces el amor a Dios no es abstracto, se concreta so, en el prójimo. So loving God prójimo. isn't something that's abstract. It's se concreta en el prójimo. It's something that we do by loving those around us. Right, so as with all the parables, we have to flesh out the background. And I would flesh it out exactly that way. It seems to me wildly implausible to suppose that Jesus is saying, hey, look, whatever, whatever you agreed on, because look, the landowner and the manager are in a extreme power situation with respect to these unemployed day laborers standing in the market there. And so, you, so it's just implausible to suppose that any old arrangement that they agree on because they're desperate is, is just. I think the background is probably something like the landowner saying, all, all these people need a, need a living wage. They've all got families. That that accounts for, we should imagine that is accounting for his is supporting everybody and not just saying, well, the, the, the last guys get one eighth. <laughs> I mean, the first is the going daily wage. Now imagine the landowner picking and getting these late laborers and saying, I'll give you a, a fifth of the going daily wage. Um, so, so my interpretation is the progressive interpretation as opposed to the righteous interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, oh yeah, flour flourishing, flourishing is never by yourself. It's always in relations. But but to confine it to right relations feels goes beyond right relations. Really? 